Torre, a Eduardo Pérez de Lema, will be the moderator. A very good morning to all of you. This round table will be carried out in English, so I will swap languages. Uh, uh, everyone, I wanted to thank, first of all, MAFRE Global Risk to, first of all, organizing this event in Salamanca, which is a great location to do that. And also to give us a chance to talk a little bit about reinsurance. It's, uh, as you know, most of you, you are not directly involved in reinsurance. As, uh, but you are influenced a lot by what we are doing in the market as, as reinsurers. And of course, we provide a lot of capacity and, uh, and part of the risk that you are seeing comes into the reinsurance world. So of course, this market has a substantial influence on, on your business on a daily basis. And in this market, we, there have been a lot of developments recently. Uh, we have changed a lot of things. Uh, how we access capital, how the markets are reacting, who the players are in the market, so there, there are changes. And what I think that it doesn't change, and uh, that's a personal view, is that we are still relevant, that we will still be relevant in the future, and actually that reinsurance is a great product uh, uh, for supporting our industry. Um, I have to say, when, when we want to talk about reinsurance today, we are extremely lucky because uh, we have uh, representatives of three organizations here that are the broken industry uh, in, in reinsurance. Bo all houses do a little bit of insurance as well, but uh, here they are as reinsurance brokers. And together, they represent 90% of the brokerage market in the world, which is a really impressive uh, number. And of course, uh, I don't know how much that represents of the global market, but it's a very significant and growing part of the market where these three broken houses are involved. <laughs> so it's difficult that we find anyone better than them to give us a, a view on how the market is doing and reacting. And with it, within that, we are really honored because we have actually the three persons that are mainly running those operations uh, in, on a worldwide basis, so that's not uh, an obvious thing. And I think it's very rare that you sit together on the same panel uh, at the same time. It's, uh, this is, uh, you know very well that these three gentlemen uh, are competing fiercely every day. But uh, the good thing about this industry is that uh, it's an industry where we compete a lot, but then at the same time we have good personal relationships and very civilized competition. So that's uh, very good to, to have you here. And uh, the three of them are a part of leading the organizations. They are all in the market and have been all in the market. They have been brokers for many years altogether and they are still involved in the market, meeting with clients and doing business and actually broking as I think with all of them, we have at some point do a little bit of broking, so I think it's a real privilege. So let me introduce them, and first of all, thank you for being here. It's not easy to come to Spain, to Salamanca. You are coming from New York, you're, and both of you are coming from London. It's not easy, so thank you very much for being here. When I introduce him, please allow me to be short, because I won't tell uh, all the things that they are, have been, or are doing, because it would be too long and we wouldn't spend half of it. <laughs> so it's, uh, so I, by geographical order, so on my right I have Dominic Christian. He's the global chairman of Aon Reinsurance Solution and also a member of the global executive of Aon Group. He started in the industry 35 years ago, and in 1984. And I was not surprised, but it, as a facultative broker, which is, I, I never knew him as a facultative broker, but, uh, but then, because 1989, he moved to Greg Fester as an international reinsurance treaty broker and specialized on retrocession. And from there, he never really moved. He was integrated many times in different in in companies, but never moved, uh, being a director in Greg Fester in 1995. Then, when Greg Fester merged with Benfield in 1997. He continued as a retrocession broker and then was appointed a Group International CEO and the CEO of Benfield in 2005. And uh, later when uh, Aeon acquired Benfield since <coughs> in 2008, he had again several positions, but one as international CEO, 
co-CEO and now as executive chairman of, uh, also of International and CEO of UK. In addition to that, he is a member of the Council of Lloyds and a councilman of the City of London and many other things that I won't uh, realize that, that he's doing at the same time. On my left, I have Peter Hearn. First, it's, uh, he's president and CEO of Guy Carpenter and a member of the Marsh McLean and Company's executive committee. Uh, he started a, a little bit earlier, 41 years ago, in, in reinsurance. And uh, he began in 1978 uh, with Willis Faber, uh, working in North America on casualty, facultative, marine, and I would say everything in the US reinsurance marketplace. Uh, then he joined Towers, Perrins, Foster and Crosby in 1986. After that, in 2000, uh, sorry, 1994, uh, he joined Willis Ree as a senior vice president and also grew through the organization to eventually become the global CEO and later the global chairman. And since 2016, he holds his current position. So thank you for being here. And finally, we have James Kent, finally, geographically, not <laughs> by any other mean, who is uh, global uh, CEO of Willis Re. Uh, he started his career 30 years ago. He spent 13 years with Aon Re and then moved to Willis Re in 2004 to run the Bermuda operation. Uh, later, he became chairman uh, of the North America operation in, uh, in the US. And uh, he returned the, back to the to UK uh, to become uh, uh, deputy CEO and later CEO of Willis Re internationally. So we have here more than 100 years <laughs> of uh, broker experience and the big market share that we are presenting. So I'm sure that we have a, a great opportunity to talk about. I, I asked the three of them that we wouldn't prepare much the, this uh, session. So just wanted to have a chat and talk about different topics. And I didn't want to tell too much about those topics so that we know their genuine views on things rather than having prepared corporate messages. So just talking about and I know the three of them are more than capable to talk long <laughs> enough about any topics. So, so that's good. So uh, I would say we, we start. And uh, also later on, I would invite you to also uh, ask some questions if, if you want. So and I don't know who wants to start uh, to give us just a, a quick overview on how you see the, the industry, the reinsurance industry today, how, how we are today. I don't know who wants to start. It's, um, Go ahead. Okay. Tom, for example. Well, I'm on the right, so I'll kick off. And, um, first of all, thank you for the honor and privilege of allowing me to be with you. It's lovely to see so, so many old friends. Um, interesting what you're saying about the three of us being on a panel together. It is rare. In fact, I think it's the first time. So thank you for bringing us together. Uh, but reinsurance brokers are quite an interesting breed for two reasons. Uh, whilst we are heavily competing every second and every day and probably will go away in half an hour and compete and so forth, the values of our three companies are very similar. The values of what we do are the same uh, by and large. And why do I say that? Because the first challenge of our industry, insurance or reinsurance, is to bring our culture, our identity to our clients. And foremost among those, those must be consistency and integrity. Uh, and actually, I'd like to think that all three of our firms have that in, in actually quite considerable degree. The other thing that a broker always is, and we three know this very well, is I went to the Champions League football game um, in Madrid on Saturday. Uh, great atmosphere, by the way. Not a great game, a great atmosphere. And the three of us are very much player coaches. So every day, we literally do broke. We are trading every day. You're trying to run a firm, but you're actually physically broking, just as Eduardo is, actually. And that's, I think, the difference, perhaps, between reinsurance leadership and insurance leadership. In most of our insurance businesses, the leaders of those businesses are less likely to be actually broking every day, but in reinsurance, we are. Somehow, in reinsurance, and I think it's our first issue, we have to ensure that we maintain that talent, that dynamic of people who are able to lead, but also people who are very comfortable in client circumstances. And that, for me, is a sort of longer-term challenge for the reinsurance broking world. In terms of what are the industry issues, I think it's, first of all, about, uh, if we start with the various audiences, um, this probably is not the right order of audiences, but forgive me if we go this way. 
Your first audience is your shareholder. Um, so how are the reinsurance industry and indeed the insurance industry responding to the uh, demands of shareholders? Well, the response is pretty good, but the performance in the last couple of years hasn't been. And the insurance industry, the reinsurance industry in particular, is probably operating at a return on equity or has been for the last two or three years, which is about a half to two thirds of where it should be to satisfy shareholder long-term return. So that's the first principal concern, long-term or stable financial profitability. Around that comes the second question, which is why is that challenging? And the principal reason it's challenging is because in reinsurance in particular, never underestimate the role of the weather, never underestimate the role of climate. And actually, if you look at the sort of contribution to reinsurance companies, to their profitability, over the last 10 years, about a third to a half of profitability is generated through successful catastrophe treaty or weather underwriting. So thinking through the catastrophe insurance market, its profit, its future profit, how to be successful in it, is critical to the first point of actually industry profitability. That leads to all sorts of broader subjects like climate change, by the way, and so forth. So that's the second one. The third is, of course, around actually the fact that the expense base is too high, and that's not just because we brokers are perceived to take too much from it, actually it's because actually the organization, the structure of the value chain is now too labored. There are too many parts to it, and that will need to change. So there are those three, I would say, I would go for culture first as the principal thing we need to think about, and thus the client experience. Two would be industry profitability. Three would be um, how it is that climate has an effect on industry profitability. And four, then, the expense ratio challenge that we face. Mm -hmm. Anything? Uh, you know, <clears throat> we live in a world, uh, as you do, where change is uh, omnipresent. Um, I think there's two important aspects of change. One is to Eduardo's specific question with regard to the changing nature of the market. It is certainly transitioning. Uh, two years and $240 billion of loss will do that. Um, the influx of alternative capital, which is about $100 billion on top of the traditional reinsurance capital, has had a moderating effect on, on price. Uh, that's now changing as they've realized that this business can create significant loss as it's created significant profit for them over the past several years. So the business in the market is certainly transitioning and it'll be yet to be determined how much it does that and whether it gets to a point where prices rise enough that more capital comes in and suppresses the overall pricing in the reinsurance market once again. There's also change within our businesses. I, I think it's fair to say that for Dominic and James and I, um, our business model is, is changed significantly from when we all first started. Um, when I started in the reinsurance business, there were two paths you could go down. You could be a broker or you could be in the, the client service side. And today we run businesses where you can be in analytics, you can be in advisory, you can be in technology, you can be in claims, you can be in production, you can be in client service. So the world we operate in is, is much more diversified. And if I think about the world that we occupy, uh, again, I, and as I'm sure James and, and, and uh, Dominic will attest, we probably see, you know, three to 400 clients a year. And I would imagine that very few of those conversations involve actual reinsurance structure. What they involve is conversations around volatility, around growth, around capital, uh, around opportunity, around adaptation, and around technology. So we've really built businesses to answer those questions, is, questions which if you can do that, then the reinsurance becomes additive to that. If you go in simply to sell reinsurance, um, I think you're sort of <clears throat> mitigating yourself and, and, and sort of uh, marginalizing yourself as a vendor as opposed to a business partner. So I think all three of our businesses have more of a advisory and um, consultative aspect to them now than certainly they did when, when all three of us started many years ago. Uh, so moving on from, from or building on those, on those two themes, and I think keeping um, um, uh, something that was said earlier by, by, the, by the earlier speaker about the changing market and, and how the market is very different uh, today to how it would have been 15 years ago. Um, I think the market is, is actually quite logical today. Um, there is, as Dominic said, uh, an abundance of capital, but there's also been a, a, a significant test of that capital in the last two years, as Peter just said. So 
Um, but what we're seeing is, is, is something that, that hasn't actually happened in prior cycles, which is we are seeing a differentiation by product and by geography and by client itself in terms of how reinsurers are reacting to the, to the losses that exist today. Um, and we have some, some clear examples of recent, recent renewals where uh, in Japan, which is a, a large reinsurance market, and in Florida, which is the largest property cap market in the world, where we have seen a great variety in pricing rather than just a general market pricing. And I, I think that is, that is the, the biggest change that, that we see in, in today's market where, where it isn't one size fits all. And a large part of that is the technology and data that Peter was talking about um, that allows more informed decisions um, by the reinsurance market. Good. Thank you. Um, we, we have been already talking a little bit about the new sources of capital that are in the market and how they are approaching us. And I see that a little bit different because we had, and it's not coming in, well, it's coming after a somehow hard earning market, but not really in a hard market. But in the past, what we saw is when the market changed, we had new reinsurance companies set up. We are not seeing that now, so it's directly the capital markets entering in the, in the, in the space. Do you see that this is a fundamental change or is it just a different way of approaching things, investing in a reinsurance company or going direct? Do you see that as a real market change or, or change in the investment community and how they want to take the risk? Or is it just that they found a new way but effectively they are doing the same thing as when we saw in the 90s where, or after 2001, new reinsurance being formed. Yeah. So to, to put some, some context around that, the, the ILS market, the, the capital markets, the, the, the uh, capital that has come into the business in the last 10 years, principally from the pension funds, is about 20% of the total reinsurance capital today. That does exclude Berkshire Hathaway that has a, has a huge source, over $200 billion of capital themselves. So about 20% of the, of the capital that exists in reinsurance today is, is ILS or, or, or pension funds. Um, at, at this point, uh, it has taken a pause, but there has been a very strong growth in the previous 10 years of that capital. So it's about, it's about 90 to $100 billion, depending on, on, on whose analysis um, you view that at. Uh, it has taken a pause because, as Peter said, that the, the, the catastrophe losses of the last two years have been a wake-up call to that part of the industry that they are at some point going to pay losses. But, but I think uh, that, that it will find its way to keep coming. Um, and I, I think that for, for two reasons. One is just the sheer scale of the, of the reinsurance industry which is less than 1% of all funds, all, all pension funds uh, worldwide. So it is a tiny part of the total assets available to deploy. Um, but the second thing is that it is actually now partnering with most reinsurance companies around the world. So if you look at reinsurance companies around the world, most of them are now partnering with pension fund capital themselves. And I think that's a, that's, that's a happy marriage because you have the expertise and distribution of the reinsurance business allied with the, with the very fluid capital that exists in the ILS market. And, the reason that, and what, that, what that has done, Eduardo, is it means that there haven't been the startup companies because the capital is moving to the, to the established companies that are already there rather than new companies being formed. It doesn't mean that there isn't the occasional new company and there is a well-known Lloyd's uh, uh, underwriter of 40 years, Stephen Catlin, who is establishing a new, a new insurance and reinsurance company and, uh, as we speak. But, but most of the new capital that comes into the insurance industry, uh, reinsurance industry today is going into, into, into reinsurance companies that already exist. I think the fungibility of capital um, in every industry is um, magnified by the amount of capital that exists in the world markets today. I, I think there's some, there's some fundamental aspects that, that need to be described, which is we all grew up in a world where it was what was the right risk for the exposure that you're underwriting. We are now seeing a world where capital has come in and it isn't so much about what is the right risk, it is what is the right yield on the money that I'm providing. 
So if the cost of your capital of a traditional reinsurer is 9% and the return you're getting is 7.5% for a traditional reinsurer, that's unacceptable. If the cost of your capital is 3% or 4% of a pension fund, 7.5% looks very good and quite frankly, they'll bite your arm off for 7.5% because it's this blind pursuit of yield. Now, for the past several years since they've been active in the market, so really from 2006 to 2016, they had 10 years where you know they were getting a nice steady return of 7.5% to 9% on their money. All of a sudden, we have two years where there is $240 billion of loss, and those returns go to low single digit, even below their cost of capital. So I think the point we're trying to make is it's given everybody pause to sit there and say, at the end of the day, we can't violate the underlying principle of reinsurance, which is what is the right price for the exposure I'm taking on, which is a very different aspect than what is the right yield for my money. I think there's another fundamental issue as well is, is for Eduardo and for Dominic and James, our clients are all one and the same, whether it be Mapfree as a client, um, but when you get into the capital markets, their clients are different. Their clients are their investors. And what we've seen is in certain losses where there is an issue as to whose right do I have to defend, the client or the investor, we've seen issues where they've sided on the side of the investor to the exclusion of, of our collective clients, and that's created some issues as well. It's, it's not replete, but it has happened in some specific instances, and I think it's given all, us all pause as to you know, who is actually the client and are their interests aligned with our client's interests. So I would say um, you know, reinsurance is capital specialization, so if we're not attracting all forms of capital to what we do, it would be, we wouldn't be doing a very good job as the reinsurance sector of the industry. I do think it lives very much in reinsurance. I'm not sure how far the process of alternative capital gets to insurance. There is some, but it isn't really very well formed. There'll be more. Is that kind of capital that's attracted to our business, the insurance community, the reinsurance community, here to stay? Absolutely. Will it take different forms? Will the players come and go? You know, 10 years ago, the top 15 insurers in Europe were very different to today. Five of them have changed. So you'll see changes in who they are. I absolutely agree with Peter's caution about some of the claims that have happened. If we um, have a difficult claims conversation with your own company, we know who to talk to. So at reinsurance, we can, in the end, talk to Eduardo. It's very fine who, if you have a difficult claims issue with an inf a fund, who do you talk to in the end is a quite a difficult kind of conversation. Uh, so you have that challenge. And actually, there is the fact, which could be helpful to the industry in one sense. I mean, most of these funds were not active, sorry, were unable to be very supportive to uh, those clients who wished to try and access that capital in 2009. So credit crunch will affect that world in a way that it doesn't affect the other world of reinsurance, the rated carry world. It affects it a bit, but not to the same degree. So in a way, that sort of balance of capacity and support kind of is helpful for clients. Will it actually be something that actually kind of morphs into uh, other classes, which is an often asked question, tends to live in property catastrophe reinsurance and per risk property business? A little bit but I'm not convinced meaningfully personally, although there's lots of efforts made by all three of our companies to try and find other classes of business that this capital will go to. Lastly, in terms of new company startups, uh, that you referred to Eduardo, and again, I agree with James on this. The, um, the challenge with a new company startup, by the way, being a broker or an underwriter, is just the infrastructure costs, the regulatory burden that you now face to set up a company. And actually, you then need to get scale heavily uh, or you need to be particularly expert in something that others aren't. Actually, great companies are expert at lots of things. You are expert at lots of things. You're not reliant on any one business. You're expert throughout what you do. So it's quite hard for a small organization to be more expert than you are in very much. It doesn't mean it can't be. So therefore, you've got to raise a lot of capital to, be, to come into any of our parts of the, the sector actually, and you've got to get a return that's going to try and work for you when you've got a very, very high expense rate basic against that. No, it's, um, it, it's clear when we talk especially, specifically about capital markets in, in reinsurance in general, we tend to think that everything is just 
catastrophe reinsurance, uh, and I think, uh, and especially for the clients of MAFRE that are here, they, they have many more needs than just the catastrophe reinsurance. And there it's, is there, um, if th that capital wants to support and get uh, uh, on that, probably they need a different infrastructure to, to uh, deal with that, and probably traditional reinsurance is more uh, a way to invest if you want to provide that, I guess. Yeah, I think you made a great point, because you know, we call our, the insurance business a property and casualty business. More property it should soon be called a casualty and property business. Most of the original clients, risk managers here are actually you will look at your short your property needs, but actually you're really interested, really interested in what your casualty needs are. What are your long term financial difficulties around that? You're really interested in other classes. Property is reasonably easily um, determined sort of what your exposure is, but actually trying to determine your exposure to actually um, our directors office insurance, arguably to cyber and 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 to operational risk and so forth. These are far more meaningful um, areas of risk to most corporations today than they were 10 to 20 years ago. I think that uh, what we've seen is, is we've seen uh, traditional reinsurance companies actually investing into these ILS funds now. So we've seen a company called Markel that has bought Nafila, which is the single largest ILS fund in reinsurance. We, we saw only two days ago White Mountains invest in a fund called Elementum. Amlin has its own fund. And, and it comes back to that point that I made about the marriage, is that, that ILS capital is often best deployed behind the reinsurance company. And the reinsurance company can manage different exposures. No, so not just the property cat. So I think you'll, have these, you'll continue to have specialist property cat ILS funds, but a lot of the ILS capital will actually end up behind traditional reinsurance companies like Matfrey, who are better at, at, at understanding risk. They have the distribution, they have the client relationship. And I think that's the evolute, that's the next stage of the ILS, of the ILS capital. I think the other thing is, is, is we have to put this in perspective as well. Uh, alternative capital, uh, the majority of the retrocessional capacity comes from alternative capital. Um, in the United States, about 15% of the reinsurance placement is in the alternative market, pr principally in Florida. Europe, very little. Japan, very little. And Australia, somewhat. So, uh, to your point, is, is even in the areas they specialize, they have a footprint, but it is not excessive. I think the other thing, too, is, is we talk about other lines of business, and the reason why property catastrophe is attractive to these funds is it's short duration. It isn't interest rate related. When you start getting into longer lines of business, like casualty and third-party business, where you have long duration risk, you then start to get into correlated risk with what they do, which is really, if you write a piece of business in the United States, if you write umbrella liability in the United States, you're writing it today, not knowing whether you've made money or not on it for 20 years, and then it's really just an interest rate play. Do it, can I hold the money long enough at a big enough interest rate to make money at the end of the 20 years? And that, that is very correlated to their portfolios, and that's why I think inherently it's something that they've stayed out of and, and kept it more short-term and short-duration in the nature of the risk that they underwrite. Good, thank you. That's, that's a relief because the traditional reinsurance have a future as well, which is, uh, which is good, and, uh, and we like that. W one of the things uh, that we have seen also is uh, concentration in this industry. Uh, we won't talk now about broker industry. We can talk later about that, but also on the reinsurance. We have seen concentration, people coming together. You mentioned already uh, reinsurance buying ILS funds to, to have a different approach. And uh, so can you give us a bit of insight on what is the rationale of this concentration? And maybe also what we are seeing is a change for coming back for bigger insurance organizations, investing in reinsurance, having reinsurance operations, uh, which is, obs is the opposite of what happened in the years 2002, 2003 where there were very little, very few uh, re insurance groups that had a reinsurance operation. What has changed in the industry that uh, people have decided to go this route? Um, the, the, you're right, the, 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 the scale and, and speed of acquisitions in the last three years um, in insurance and reinsurance has definitely accelerated. And what you've seen on both insurance business and reinsurance business is carriers moving towards scale. 
And I think it comes back to a, a number of things that we've already spoken about, Eduardo, which is the ability to trade with clients across the piece. We have seen insurance buyers, when they look at their reinsurance panels, look at a panel of six, eight, ten reinsurers and say that those are my core reinsurers that I want to trade with over a period of time. I want to know that my claims are going to get paid in 20 years' time, so there has to be balance sheet strength, there has to be expertise, and there has to be a relationship that, that, that allows, allows me to know that I am going to get my claims paid um, across those different business lines. And consequently, we've seen balance sheets grow um, and fewer, fewer players, fewer reinsurers um, uh, there to trade. So uh, as an organization, we are doing more with our larger trading partners and doing less with, with smaller uh, reinsurers that becomes a more opportunistic type of relationship. So that's, that's one aspect. I think the other aspect is there is a lot of capital and growth has been very, very difficult over the last decade. And the quickest way to grow, it's not necessarily the best way to grow, but the quickest way to grow is to buy something. So we have seen, uh, uh, one example would be AXA, that, that was predominantly, or was an insurance company, and predominantly personal and small commercial lines. And they have gone and bought, with XL Catlin, a company that specializes in, in, in commercial uh, complex insurance risk and reinsurance. And, that allows them to grow in an area that if they were to build it, would have taken more than a decade to, to build it and possibly not succeeded in doing so. So I think those are, the, those are two of the aspects that really are driving the consolidation that we see on the insurance and reinsurance underwriting side. You know, there's an old, there's an old adage that says when you can't grow, buy. Uh, and I'd say a number of acquisitions have been a function of that. I think there's also the... Uh, the more insidious element of it, which is, you know, if you think about our business, we have this supply chain where if you have a teacher in Boston who insures their house through uh, Marsh, and then it goes and is insured through Commerce, and then in, the Maffrey then says and buys their reinsurance through any one of us, and then we go into the retrocessional market for capacity behind that, that same teacher's pension fund might be the ultimate capital behind that teacher's house that's being insured. So if you think about that supply chain and the inefficiency of that supply chain, which takes anywhere from 63 to 93 cents out of every dollar, I think there's a, there's a, there's a more um, uh, fundamental issue here is, is consolidation is creating this pressure on bringing capital to risk in the most efficient manner that it possibly can. And whether it's from outside the industry or inside the industry, I think everyone's trying to figure out that dilemma, which is how do I bring capital to risk in a much more efficient manner than exists today? I think, I think I'd add two points to, to what the guys have said, if I might. Um, one is uh, it's rarely now sufficient to be connected to a client on one line of business. And many businesses essentially were expert at one thing. Now, you could argue in property treaty that's not the case, but certainly in insurance it's tr not true. You're trying to offer a variety of services to a client. Many businesses couldn't do that, so therefore they couldn't be as relevant to clients potentially than I wish to, particularly in uh, the commercial sector and the large risk sector and so forth, which so many of you are involved with. The second would be that the changing nature of global capital. So if you look at the process of the sort of many of the insurance company purchases, actually it started with the Japanese essentially, the Japanese companies 10 years ago, realizing or thinking that actually, and rightly, that actually they had substantial exposure in Japan, but had no diversification to that exposure. And the three largest Japanese companies, not only did actually the six largest merge together, but they also then chose to buy a series of entities outside Japan. So for me, you're going to see this continue, not least because actually where you look where capital currently lies, you look actually at expertise, then you'll see certainly much more M&A than we've known for some time. Good. Let's then move to consolidation on your space, on, on brokers. All, I think all of you or your firms definitely have been going through the process more recently or less recently, but uh, you were all involved with us. And uh, I won't ask you if you personally think it's good or bad for the industry, but, uh, but uh, at least to, to understand um, 
what is the rationale behind so much concentration? We talked 90% of the reinsurance market is, uh, broker reinsurance markets is in, in three hands. And uh, also if your perception is if you were just reinsurance brokers, forgetting about the rest of the business of your groups, if this concentration would have been exactly the same or is, or, or is it just the consequence of the wider groups looking for concentration and what is happening to the reinsurance broking market? Well, Maybe since, you are the closest since, since to I'm that. I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start. I, I'm going to be a little controversial here because I think in any industry where you have more suppliers than distributors, I don't think that's healthy for the industry. And uh, I, I say that with the, the view that competition is good for everybody. Competition is good for Maffrey as a buyer. Competition is good for, for Tom and, and James and I because it makes us all that much sharper, that much keener, that much more urgent, that much more passionate about providing a, a host of services to our clients. Um, <clears throat> quite frankly, uh, I, I'm sure that the um, acquisition of JLT by Marsh was not driven by JLT. It was most certainly driven by the acquisition of JLT specialty and JLT insurance. Um, be, be that as it may, to James' point earlier is <clears throat> I think there needs to be diversification. I think, it, as I said, it's good for everyone. It's good for the industry. But there's equally, as I said before, our buyers today are, are worried about concerns outside of the reinsurance transaction. And to be able to have the scale and the scope and the financial wherewithal to be able to constantly invest in our business. Uh, because as I think, as I said, the most important thing is to understand what you are in your business. And we have gone from all being traditional traders and transactors to being strategic advisors with execution capabilities. So as the business changes, as the needs of a map free change and our client base changes, we have to be able to adapt to that and reimagine our business. And <clears throat> the only way to do it that I see today is scale given the order of magnitude that's required from us by our clients globally to provide capability, product, people, technology in order to help them grow and, uh, and prosper. Just expanding on that, uh, trying not to be repetitive here, but if, if you do go back 15, 20 years, the one thing that we did for our clients was place reinsurance. And the, the clients had an, an expansive list of, of brokers that they could trade with. And for some clients, it was which broker I, do I either have the best personal relationship with, so I will trade with that particular broking company, or B, which broker is going to go and get me the, the, lowest, the lowest cost deal? And that's the broker that I'm going to go with. But that was really the scale of the relationship. It was either personal or it was cost. And, and those were the two things that established the relationship. Peter's right. You know, when, when, when we go and see our clients today, often, and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the discussion is rarely around reinsurance because we... <laughs> We all, we all will tell you that we can do the best job for you as your reinsurance broker in terms of the transaction, but arguably the market, with 90% of the, of the market going through these three brokers, the market sets itself. So the, the way that we differentiate ourselves with the clients is how we help them with their business. And the fact is today, whether it's talking about technology, whether it's talking about predictive analytics, whether it's talking about capital management, whether it's talking about growth, acquisitions, these are the things that are driving the conversations that our brokers and, and analytics teams are having with the clients. And to have that expertise is challenging. It's expensive. It takes time. You know, we, 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 I, Willis Re is the smallest of the, of, of the three companies that are up here today. And we have 2,500 people in our organization. And, and, and of those, five or 600 would be described as brokers. So there is a whole cast of, 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 of support behind the brokers that are helping our clients in other ways beyond the transaction. And that, that cost of entry to build that is very, very difficult today. So do I see the 90% changing? I don't, and that's not being defensive. I do, we have seen spin-offs. We've seen some independent brokers trying to build, but it is very, very difficult to build a model, a broking model, that will challenge Aon, Guy Carpenter, or Willis in terms of what we bring to our clients? So I, um, I think the first thing to say is that it's 90% of what? 
Uh, the reinsurance market, global market premium is about 180 billion or so. We've all got slightly different figures, but it's about that. Which 50% isn't intermediated. We would like it to be, uh, but it isn't. So there's vast room to grow for all three of these firms, I think, uh, heavily. Here's the challenge. Uh, we've gone from being, I started with a broker of 18 people. There are 18 of us. Um, I haven't moved much since. No one's wanted, wanted me, really. The, but we were then a dating agency. We're now a data service business. We were then ad men. We're now advocates. We were then agents. We're now advisors. Let me give an example why. And I hope you don't mind, guys. I wrote this down. But I had a meeting yesterday with, in fact, it was, I had to present to a board yesterday of an insurance company. I'm a reinsurance broker. So what questions would you ask a reinsurance broker? These were the questions I got. Are my products differentiated? Am I operating in profitable markets? How can I win the distribution game? Is my value proposition clear to customers and distributors? Are we paying claims in an efficient, low-cost, expedient manner? You talk about my loss ratio. Could we talk about our expense ratio? Am I using third-party capital optimally? And of course, can you reduce my cat retention on my treaty? The, the specific one of those questions I might have been asked 20 years ago was the last one. That was about five minutes of the hour we spent together. Now, you have to be, believe me, a very sizable organization to answer these questions, because no one person can, and certainly 18 people where I started couldn't. And that's what's expected of us. And when we talk to your colleagues and to Eduardo and his team about reinsurance or retrocession, of course we're talking about that topic as they wish us to, but actually you expect more from us. You expect an analytical service, you expect a sort of understanding of risk. What brokers do today is very different because it was a transactional service. Now our principal role is to understand your risk or to help you understand it. Then we transact in either the capital markets or the, non or the traditional markets. And actually, what are we achieving overall? We're trying to help you grow your business. It's, it's interesting, Dominic, talking about 50% of the reinsurance business is actually still not intermediated. And that for us is, is, is uh, the great opportunity because we will bring all those, th those things that Dominic just said about how we're going to help clients in terms of everything about their business, including reinsurance. And the challenge that the direct market has is, is in terms of investment to compete in terms of that advice. And it's not to say that the direct market can't do it. But, 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 it, but in North America, Peter, when, you, when, when going back 30 years, if you take the direct markets, 90% of their business came through the direct markets and 10% through the brokers. And that has flipped on its head. Now, of what were considered direct markets, 90% of the business they now write goes through the brokers. Uh, that hasn't happened in parts of Europe. It hasn't happened in parts of Latin America. And that is, a, that is a big opportunity for both the brokers and therefore the reinsurance industry as a whole for that growth to come in through the, intermedia, in, the, the intermediaries and, and, and into the reinsurance market. I think all of us have built businesses to sit there and say, <clears throat> we'd like you to call us if you have a problem, not just if you have a reinsurance problem. If you have a problem with any part of your business, we have a response to that. And I think that separates you from being an intermediary to being a business partner. And I think if you're just seen as an intermediary, you, you limit yourself in the view of your clients. And if you're considered as a business partner, uh, you have to have value and dependency to have a successful relationship with your clients. So I, wa I wanted to ask how much of your time is dedicated to traditional broken. I think you answered all of that, which is a fraction of what you actually do today is, is really broken, even if you are today a broker, but probably you're more a consultant today than, than anything different than that. And, uh, the fun part's the broken. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good. Um, I couldn't spend uh, without talking about innovation and transformation, digital transformation uh, today. And uh, sometimes uh, it is perceived as a threat to brokers, uh, this disintermediation. Probably after what uh, we said uh, a minute ago, probably less so on what you're doing. But how do you see the market changing and um, in the reinsurance broking market and, and probably also the, the large commercial broking, which is very similar to reinsurance broking, uh, changing in, because of technology, through technology in, in the future? And I think, uh, and I don't know if everyone is aware, but uh, I, I read recently, and I don't have the full details, but uh, Aeon and Guy Carpenter working together in platforms to place business, uh, which is something that is new, 
uh, how these trends are, are going and evolving, how are you seeing that, con that, that coming? Or are you... Well, I think there are a couple of aspects to that question. Um, I, I think, first of all, um, no one is paying any of us to have an inefficient business. So I think the first level is, is to drive technology, to drive inefficiency out of <coughs> our business model. I think the other aspect is I always find it interesting when technology companies come in to see us, as I'm sure it's true with Dom and James, and they say, we're here to disrupt your business. And when you explain to them what your business actually is, they realize how complex it is. <coughs> I think we will all, as an industry, take, excuse me, <coughs> take technology to disrupt ourselves. I think what we need to look at is how technology is going to change the nature and the face of risk. And the technologist today might be the client tomorrow. You know, how um, technology will change aspects of automobiles coverage through autonomous risk where the liability lies when it goes from a, a, a human to a machine. Um, the impact of social and um, uh, legal evolution through technology. And then climate change, not that that's technologically driven, but the, the, the understanding of it is based on more advanced technology. So I think it's more important for all of us as an industry to understand how technology is going to change the face of risk and how all of us adapt to it. You as the insurer, us as the broker. And so for us and as an industry, I think that you know, the idea that technology is going to disrupt our business in total, I think is, is, is not the right answer. I think that is it, we will take technology to disrupt ourselves. Um, I, certainly when you look at where technology um, is, is applying itself, the bulk of it is in distribution. You know, you have sensors, you have wearables, you have business process, very little underwriting, uh, very little in claims to date. Um, but I think in general, it will drive greater efficiency through all of our businesses. So um, I guess I'll start with, uh, I was on a panel with um, a guy from Google recently. He ran Google's uh, European practice. I think he was 27 years old. Uh, very interesting about insurance though. And he said they had failed in insurance and will continue to. It did mean someone else might not be successful. And he cited two principal reasons, one of which I think I knew, the other I hadn't thought about enough. And his view was that actually a 60% of what insurance, uh, of insurance premiums are mandated, are regulated. So for them that's quite a difficult area. But the more interesting comment was the brands of the leading insurers of the world are incredibly powerful. And James was talking earlier about ILS funds backing into reinsurance companies and so forth. I think that's a spot on, by the way. But actually, in a sense, he thought actually there could be partnerships through the great brands. But he thought it unlikely that they themselves, it doesn't mean someone else might not. So that was one. The second is actually on digital transformation. I must congratulate you. I know you've got your session on Brazil in a moment on your success in Brazil and in Germany and what you're doing there. And we can learn from you from that, by the way, so thank you very much indeed, but I think it's fantastic what's going on. Thirdly, I don't actually feel for a moment that we will be intermediated, back to Peter's point. If we're not offering value, then we shouldn't be there in the first place. So actually for me, kind of, there'll be uh, these sort of factors going on. There's a thousand, as I've just seen it recently, as though there are a thousand insurtech startups in the last four years that are funded a thousand. Actually, and yet as my company, which is not a small company, I assure you their impact on us is tiny. And it doesn't mean we're living in the past, it just means I think the process of actually digital change is going to be much slower in some cases than we realize. And the principal reason for that is clients. Because some of the great clients, the more sophisticated clients, many of you are here, actually can adopt that change. But most people who buy their insurance still aren't ready for that change. And it's the, until that generational change happens, I'm not convinced actually um, the sort of digital transformation takes place quite as strongly as we think. Yeah, I, I think if you, if you take those thousand insure tech companies that have got funding in the, last, in the last three years, if you go back three years, those companies thought that they were going to be the next map for a. But as Dominic said, insurance is a highly regulated business, and as Peter said, it's a highly complex business, and it is very hard to become the next map fray. And, and we've seen this change from these companies thinking they were going to disrupt the industry, 
to actually supporting the industry. And it, a lot of that comes back to brand, where if an insure tech company walks in and, and says, I'm going to be the next Matt Frey, then they're not going to be there. If they're going to walk into Matt Frey and say, we have some technology that can improve your claims experience for your customer, and it can reduce your, ex your claims expense ratio by 2% because of this, that, and the other, that, then that technology is something that Matt Frey are very interested in. The insure tech company that is providing that technology will get paid for what they're bringing and it makes the customer and agency experience that much better as well. So that's, that's the evolution that we see in, 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 in InsureTech um, right now. So it's, it, it's not to say that it won't continue to have an impact. It will. <clears throat> I also think it's a great opportunity for the industry where I saw a statistic that 65% of the global population have an iPhone or, 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 or an electronic phone but for only 45% of the, of the global population have access to insurance. And, and, and that technology is going to be the link between insurance and that customer. So it's actually, it, it should increase the demand for insurance. It should increase the awareness about insurance. And rather than technology being a threat, a threat technology can be the, the turbocharge that will, will continue to provide growth and much needed insurance um, around the world. I wonder if there are some subjects that are just too big for one, any one company to find the right answer to. So the reason that Carpenters and AN references have come together in part is because uh, you know, we don't often come together on too many things other than the fact we have respect for each other. Uh, is in part because this is a massive subject that actually we think we can perhaps do better things on together and separately. We'll go our separate ways at some point on it. And actually, just as Maffrey Re, for instance, and Maffrey have a very strong relationship with Swiss Re and Munich Re, you do compete on business. So you're going to find that sort of dynamic. And I rather like your point, Peter, on climate change because that is too big a subject for one organization. So we have to have a mutualized approach to some of this. And I think on technology, it's probably the same story, actually. If you look at London, where there's been face-to-face -face trading for all of our careers, and, and many years before that, it's still going to happen. But actually, we've had to come together, these three organizations in particular, to try and modernize the London market. And we're doing a reasonable job on it, actually. So some things we have to cooperate on, which may seem str strange, Eduardo, but probably are sensible for the industry of this that's important is, you know, we've reached an analog ceiling in, in society, the world in general. And the thing is, is what, what does digitization mean? And what is the world of AI and machine learning, voice recognition? I think the impact it's going to have is as an industry, we all hoard data. We all have our individual data. We hoard onto it because it's special. Well, we're going to live in a world where data is going to be accessible to everyone. And you may make the argument that over time, all data for the insurance industry should be open source. And those people who have the requisite insight can then glean the competitive advantage from that data using their own digital capabilities. And so I think if I look out into the future, what technology will do is, is create a great leveler in this business where all data will be open source and those companies that have access and, and insight will be the ones that will be able to differentiate themselves. So it's a long topic, as, as you see, that uh, we can, could talk long about that. We are close to finish. I, I would have more, uh, more topics, but I would uh, like to give the opportunity if someone would like to rise from the audience. Um, any topic or question? It's really a, a comment rather than a question. First of all, thank you for a, an excellent debate. Um, and um, I, I just like to um, emphasize this uh, nature of collaboration between um, brokers or carriers or whatever it is. And I think that sometimes our end clients don't see the fact that we, um, we can work together. Many other industries do it. The car industry does it, does it as well. And I think there is a need to collaborate whilst at the same time you know, we, we heavily compete as well. And 
and, and I like the fact that, that we've got 90% of the, of the market up there uh, who, who have got some things that they agree with, and I'm sure outside of this uh, meeting, I've got many things you don't agree with as well. And, and I think the collaboration, both between yourselves, with us, with our, with Munich Re or Swiss Re, and together the carriers uh, collaborating with the brokers, is really healthy for, for the industry and I think helps demonstrate the, the really good point about, about the brand and about how difficult it is to for Google to, 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 to compete with, with brands like, like yours and, and Mafres and Swiss Re, Munich Re, whoever it is. So I think that was a really key point for me coming out of the debate and uh, I just wanted to make that point rather than, rather than ask a question and, and thank you for a good debate. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Chris, it's, it's no coincidence that the word mutual is at the heart of insurance. So, if there are no, no other questions, we, we have one minute left. Uh, I had one additional topic, but I think it will take us more than, <laughs> than a minute to talk about that, which is uh, one problem that I think affects us all and uh, really is causing threat to the, our ability to provide our, our service to the client and to society, which is trade barriers and barriers to transacting reinsurance in many markets where we are forced to put capital in different locations. I think it's a, it's a long theme and, uh, and probably a, an issue that we have uh, with our clients as insurers, reinsurance and brokers. But I think we won't have in 30 seconds uh, the answer for that. It's, it's well, my nation's done a very good job in recent years of, uh, says James, of causing trade barriers to be erected. Um, I'm very glad we haven't done Brexit today. Thank you, Eduardo, um, having to talk to it. But actually, kind of, uh, believe me, it's not a subject that many of us enjoy in my country. Uh, it's really problematic because the international regulatory supervisors are not connected in the way they need to be to deal with trade barriers, and that's the fundamental issue we have, I think. No, no one wins in a trade war. <laughs> no one. So thank you. thank you very much. We are just in time, so it's uh, it's. Uh, I think we are okay. Uh, thank you again very much for coming here, for being available to share this uh, this hour with us, and to come over to Salamanca. And so thank pleasure. you very much. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>